So even though most of what I'm going to describe to you will have to do with the science of polycultures, uh, the fact is that this science turns into political economy really quickly. And that is because whenever you practice agriculture, there are very specific resources that everyone is going to need, no matter what part of the planet they're doing this on. So you first of all need access to land. And specifically, it means most of the time control over that land, ownership over that land. And most of the time, um, in the majority of the world, you will need to support the productivity of that land by having access to water, which again, usually you get into contests, uh, you get into political uh, issues. And by the time that I'm done, I hope to weave that together to why this idea of polycultures and industrial agriculture are contested ideas in terms of their potential productivity. So let me get there by talking to you about why scientifically the polycultural system is actually the most productive, efficient system for agriculture that we know. So when you produce a crop, you need to have access to the land, as I mentioned, and to water because the biomass of that crop is made up of nutrients that come from the soil that are taken up in a water solution uh, from the soil by roots of crops. The energy that's required to assemble the biomass of that plant is provided by solar radiation. You can see right away the resources required to uh, perform agriculture. You need nutrients. If they're provided externally, we refer to them as fertilizers. Uh, you need water and you need carbon dioxide, which is the essential ingredient which plants take from the air, combined with the nutrients and the water in order to form the biomass. The energy to perform that is solar radiation. So that solar radiation bathes the planet for at least half the day. And so you have the basic ingredients for production in these natural elements, solar radiation, nutrients from the soil, water, which is a part of the planetary hydrological uh, cycle, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Now, all of that is just a way of talking in a non-technical way about the photosynthetic equation that some of you may remember from your elementary biology or from your high school biology. But here's the key thing about that. Radiant energy is, as I mentioned, abundant uh, all over the planet. In a monocultural system, however, we make very poor use of that radiant energy. And here, uh, this very nice illustration that you have in front of us will be helpful. It is one instance of a polycultural system, which as I've mentioned, means growing several different species in a particular uh, area of land. The, uh, what we refer to colloquially uh, as the three sister system um, is usually a system that was prevalent in Mesoamerica and was exported from there to North America, uh, based on three keystone species. But that same model of having lots of species growing simultaneously was the original model for agriculture for the very simple reason that the agricultural systems looked like the natural ecological systems that they replaced. Uh, as far as we can make out a transition from the natural ecological systems where we basically gathered to those in which we began gradually to manage what it was that we gathered in the time of year when we gathered was something that occurred over a continuum and was never really uh, a hard distinction, particularly that those performing that transition would have been necessarily conscious of it. So the model for what the agricultural system looked like was always what the natural ecology in the area where the agricultural system uh, was developed looked like. So 
there are lots of advantages to these polycultural uh, systems. And so let me first explain this in terms of that statement that I just made, that you waste radiant energy in most monocultural systems. So imagine uh, that image that you have in front of you as a canopy of leaves. The leaves are the structures of this crop stand. They're gonna be intercepting solar radiation and they're gonna be performing that uh, photosynthetic equation that I described. They'll use the energy from the sun in order to combine the carbon dioxide that is being taken up by those same leaves from the atmosphere, uh, splitting atoms in water and using that to perform chemical reactions to create amino acids, proteins, carbohydrates, uh, oils, essentially the biomass of those crops. So we think of that agronomically as a canopy. Now, a canopy in a crop stem can have several different layers, just like any ecosystem that you think is a forest. You have some of the species in the forest which have very tall canopies. They intercept light, which is very bright up at the top of the canopy. And as you progress further down into the body of the forest, that light is filtered. It becomes less powerful as you go deeper into the canopy. And there are plant species that are adapted all the way down to the bottom of the forest that can thrive with lesser and lesser amounts of light. Those, by the way, tend to be houseplant these days, uh, orchids and the like that are deep within the canopy. So these are all adapted to different niches where they use different amounts of light, different amounts of water, and different amounts of carbon dioxide that's available in their immediate micro environment. So that was for a forest. Now think about that picture that you have on the screen right now. Exactly the same logic applies. For that particular image that you have there, uh, which is a nice um, uh, cartoon of what a land race or, or some of the traditional maize varieties would look like, that is the keystone species that you see dominating that stand. Um, you can imagine that there would be three to four layers of the canopy. And so let me translate to you what that means. It means that if you imagine that corn stand planted uniformly over an acre, um, and you had just one layer of leaves over that acre, it stands to reason that you have one acre of leaves. But because there are several layers of leaves, you can actually have something like four acres in modern corn varieties, sometimes up to six acres of leaves that create a canopy over one acre of land. So six acres of leaves are performing the photosynthesis to create the biomass in that stand. Now, in a modern agricultural systems, that's it. That's all you have. As a matter of fact, I just took um, a liberty to call that a modern agricultural system because it no longer is such in the modern setting. And uh, let me explain that to you. A system is any set of parts that work in coordination to produce a specific end. And in a modern agricultural system, you don't have biological parts. You have usually one part, the wheat plant, planted hundreds of thousands of times on the same acre, the corn plant, planted 35 times on the same acre, and so on. Those are all the parts you've got. In terms of providing the nutrients, you need external fertilizers. In terms of controlling pests, you need external pesticides. In terms of controlling the fungi, you need external fungicides. You want to provide water in a place that is uh, uh, temperate where there may not be uh, concurrent rainfall to support the growth of that crop, uh, then you need to irrigate. Now, in a polycultural system, the resources that you have are the plants that you have within that system. They capture and recycle nutrients. They capture, store, and recycle water. They can share nutrients among one another. The efficiency of the system has to do with the fact that at each one of the niches within the canopy, you have a plant species that is able to take advantage of the microenvironment that is created there. Now, obviously, um, you need to choose the species that make up a polyculture in such a way that they actually do fit that specification that I just described. For instance, it would be a very bad mixture to try to create a polyculture of a corn plant, which is a very large, tall grass species with broad spreading horizontal leaves, would say a sorghum plant, which is not as tall, 
but has broad spreading horizontal leaves, they would compete for exactly the same niche in terms of light, in terms of water, and so on. So you need to have complementary species that actually fill different niches within the environment. So the Three Sisters description of a polycultural system is actually a fairly poor way of describing or understanding the system because it focuses on three of the keystone species. When you look at the way that, that these systems originally and to this date were practiced, they consisted of dozens of species growing in the same area of land. Uh, I wanted to come back and talk to you about the significance of it, but to finish this thought, um, you can see even if we stick just with the three sisters, the traditional three sisters, that the main corn plant captures the majority of sunlight and it filters the sunlight, but it, it provides trellises on which climbing species can grow. And so typically these uh, would be uh, phaseolus beings. And then on the surface of the ground where you have the reddest light, the lowest quality of light, you have broad, thick leaved species that are able to squeeze the very last amount of energy of the radiant uh, energy that reaches the surface of the ground. Instead of going to warm the surface of the ground, it is intercepted by photosynthetic leaves that can turn that into cucurbits, squashes of different types. Um, there are versions of the system that actually have subterranean species uh, as well. So, uh, for instance, peanut introduced into such a system will produce corn and beans up in the air, will produce cucurbits on the surface of the ground, and will produce peanuts within uh, the soil itself. Uh, but again, these would all be very simple systems. Now, um, before coming back to the, to the significance of, of the uh, efficiency of this polycultural uh, system, I don't want to forget that the choice of these species is in lots of different dimensions. It isn't just that they need to fit the niches that are created by the canopy itself. It's that we perform agriculture for a reason, to self-provision, to nourish ourselves. And so optimally, you're not solving just for one thing in this equation. The ecological factors are important, but you're solving for nutritional quality. So over the course of thousands of years of experimenting with solving these simultaneous equations, systems like the one that we're discussing here and their uh, equivalents all over the world give you crops that provide the optimum nutritional requirements for the populations where they generate the staples of the diet in the different parts of the world. So we would be just in completely different species if we were talking about uh, South America, if we were talking about the Mediterranean, if we were talking about Southeast Asia, and so on and so forth. Okay, now coming back to this point about the efficiency of this polycultural system. Now imagine the ecological model that I described, the naturally occurring species mix that would have been in place when we were gatherers. The fact that our agriculturist tells us the following, and it is that we descend from people that refuse to accept that what an ecologist would call their carrying capacity of the environment, meaning the number of humans that could be sustained by the amount of food that you could gather in a particular area. Um, agriculturalists refuse to accept that as the limit of their population. What it means to be an agriculturist is that you exceed the natural carrying capacity. And agriculturists don't do this because they're magicians. We do that because of the fact that we supplement the naturally occurring resources within any given food shed with resources that we bring in from outside of the system. So the industrial system is the paradigm of that. The area where uh, we grow a lot of corn or a lot of soybean or a lot of wheat or a lot of sorghum is just the staging area. You wouldn't be able to get the return on investment for the productivity that you stoke in the particular area in the modern industrial system unless from outside of the system you imported vast amounts of water and vast amounts of fertilizer and vast amounts of energy embodied in the petroleum that goes into creating the chemicals that you use to subsidize the biological productivity or to create the machinery, the steel that's required to automate the process of millions of acres uh, uniformly at one time. So polycultural systems deal with that by eliminating the need for a lot of that. Um, so the, the, there's a lot obviously that's embedded in there, but I asked you to imagine the pre-existing ecological system wherever we were on the agricultural system. At the time, there was no machinery. The limiting factor in those cases 
was human labor. You needed to get the greatest return to human labor. Obviously, if the amount of nutritional caloric value, the energy that the system returned to you was less than the energy that you put into doing the clearing, the seeding, the weeding, the harvesting, the processing of the food, you would be dead. You, it, the energetic accounting would not work. So these systems by definition had to be very productive. And we know from the history of the domestication of the original species that in fact, our uh, ancestors made very specific uh, accounting of the amount of energy that they were getting back from the effort to perform agriculture as opposed to the effort that it took to gather. So this is important for the following factor. When within a single acre, you can do what the best polyculture systems can do today, which is to produce about six times more than a monocultural system would be able to do, um, then that is the greatest return to the human labor involved. And that is what makes these the systems of the future. Because in the future, uh, the way that we will deal with the greater efficiency that we require out of, out of agricultural systems is to return to making the best use out of volume and not just the best use out of area subsidized by importing all kinds of external resources the way that we do with modern industrial systems. Uh, one last thing that I'll mention uh, about this and then tie this up for you is that uh, in that original ecological system that I'm asking you to uh, imagine, say for the Mayas in Southern Mexico, it would have been a tropical uh, forest. Um, every bit of volume in a forest canopy would have been populated by a species growing there. If you've ever walked into a forest, even into a temperate forest, you see that it's a riot of things growing on one another, things feeding on one another. The, uh, lichen on the orchids, on the lianas, on the bark of the tree, and so on. Every niche is occupied by something that's growing and transforming what is there. Um, this does away with one of the key difficulties of the modern industrial system. It's a complete artifact that in the modern industrial system, you have these large geometric row-oriented patterns, and the artifact has to do that originally, the, the predecessors of today's mechanized labor were uh, uh, implements that we drag through the field using animals and there need to be alleys so that animals could go through there. That creates the row concept. So in a modern monoculture system, you prepare a whole acre of land, you fertilize the whole acre of land, you clear the whole acre of land, but you're only gonna grow crops in rows. So you create one of the biggest problems which farmers refer to as weeds which means in the inter-row space, you get the native vegetation growing. It was there before your agricultural system. It's going to start growing. It's better adapted than the introduced species that you bring in for agriculture. And then you create the whole problem of weeds, the need for herbicides, the need for tillage, the need for cultivation. In a polycultural system that's well managed, that's an undefined issue. Not only is every niche populated, every one of the things that's growing there is edible. So you have greens growing there, they're providing you rich uh, uh, vitamin uh, sources, you have the sources of carbohydrate, you have the sources of protein. So every way that you look at the system, it is more efficient in terms of energetic use of solar radiation, in terms of labor uh, for the human being that's involved, in terms of return to nutrition, in terms of return to volume, and in terms of the utilization of all the resources there, the land, the carbon dioxide, the water. So None of you should think of this system as an archaic, so-called traditional system that is uh, marginal, that is inferior to the industrial system, it is the future of agriculture. And with that, I'll pass it on to Alfonso. Um, okay. Um, thank you, Ricardo. That was a, a perfect explanation of uh, what I'm going to talk about today, which is basically to to demonstrate what the milpa system is, that polyculture in the in Puebla, as Ricardo was mentioning, you have different um, milpas, depending on what part of Mexico you're at. For example, in the Chinantla um, jungle in Oaxaca, in the milpa, in that area, they have um, vanilla, for example. Here in Puebla, we don't have vanilla, but we, we have uh, other types of, of fruits, for example, the jocotes, 
or capulines, which is like the Mexican tree. Gracias. So um, I have 20 minutes. I'm going to show more than 40 different um, slides with different pictures that demonstrate what we have in Puebla and the Milpa system. And I wanted to begin with the Milpa because you are very aware in the United States of the three sisters that are commonly in corn, squash, and beans. In Mexico, uh, the Milpa system, unfortunately, not many Mexicans know that it, it's not only corn. When I studied gastronomy, if you ask the chefs or commune Mexicans what Milpa means to them, unfortunately, they think of only cornfields. They don't think of this millinery complex system that was invented by the Mesoamericans through experimentation, through gathering of different uh, fruits, herbs, um, etc., vegetables that they made. They invented this system, which is called the milpa. Uh, milpa means the place where you can grow, basically grow food. So that comes from the Aztec Nahuatl language, and basically. Let me see if I have the controls. So it's not only three, three sisters. You can have more than 200 different types of, of foods uh, from this milpa system, which we think it's only corn, but you can have different herbs. And I'm gonna focus more on the Mexican highlands from the Valley of Cholula and Puebla, which is where I live in case you wanna visit sometime. Focusing towards a Nahuatl community that's near the volcano Popocatépetl called San Mateo Solco because when I arrived to this community in 2005, which still has their Nahuatl uh, roots related, linked to the Milpa, uh, different from the Cholula Valley where there's more mestizos or, or Mexicans that don't necessarily reproduce the same Milpa system as we used to many, many years ago. So you can see in, in this map, the Mexican highlands on the area of Puebla Cholula, how we're very near from Mexico City, just on the other side of the volcano. And uh, if you visit this area, this is what you see in a, in a milpa system in San Mateo Solco, in this indigenous community, and near Cholula and Puebla, which is basically the milpa, a maguey, land of mag, a row of maguey plants that separates different small plots of land. Because as Ricardo was mentioning, you cannot have acres and acres of a milpa. It has to be small plots of land that are owned by different uh, communities. And, this is uh, Don Marcelino. He's basically taking out the sap, the aguamiel, from the, the maguey plant because as I did in, uh, I studied in my dissertation of gastronomy, basically before in this area, there used to be vegetarians because they could obtain tryptophan and many amino acids that we need from it, meat. They could obtain them from the agave fermented drink called pulque. And here you can see how Don Marcelino is taking out the heart of the agave plant because you basically have to sacrifice it. And by taking out the heart, which is also edible, it's very nutritious and um, you can need 15 to 20 years to eat this, this, um, this heart of, of maguey, which is very uncommon in, in many parts of Mexico. This is, I'm beginning with the maguey plant because it was very important in the Mexican highlands because it was the, a substitute for meat. It was present all year round when there weren't any other crops or fruits available. And even kids used to drink it because they were more, more nutritious and they didn't need lots of meat. And uh, the flowers also of the maguey stock, if you let the maguey grow, there's a stock that can be cut down. It can be charred into candy. Um, but you can also eat the, the flowers, the flower of the maguey plant, also the chiniquil, which, which is actually more like the, the larva of a moth. Uh, the maguey worms are very, very delicious. You can put them on salsa. These are very rare to find also. They're called pollotomat, which means wild uh, tomato, because they grow in December when the milpa is resting and they grow widely in the in the fields. There's also some fruits. This is brought by the Spaniards, but there's adapted types of apples, of pears, of peaches, that are basically the stuffing of the chili in Nogada, in case you've heard of this plate from, this dish from Puebla. This is um, walnuts that also form part of the chili in Nogada. The capulín, this is the Mexican 
Mexican cherry, so to say, that you can find within the milpa, the milpa systems. And the important thing that also Ricardo mentioned is that besides having different types of foods in this canopy, you can obtain different um, foods, so to say, from one plant. For example, the bean. The bean, you don't only eat the seed, you can eat the flower, but you can also eat the whole stalk and you can even eat the roots of the, of the bean. But in Mexico, we've lost some of those traditions because it's easier to get other types of food. Before, they, we could call them hunger foods. There used to be the hunger foods that used to, that were used a long time ago. Um, you can also find within the milpa system, let me see. Uh, different different types of flowers. From the example, this mastuerzo. I put in the botanical names of some food, so that in case you you can find them out later. Mastuerzo, that flower is a really good taste, like radish. And another important part of the milpa system, which is what gave a, um, a staple food for many Mexicans before you could get corn or any other vegetables where the quelites some of these quelites grow within the first rains of april may and they were very part of the of the food pyramid for the mesoamericans and we have there's more than 200 varieties of of quelites which quelite from now what means an edible tender wild herb or but it could be leaves it could be flowers here we have a uh, papalo and pipicha are very common and quintonil in this area and in case you've been to Puebla, which is, I call the Mexican burger, <laughs> uh, you need papalo for this traditional semita, which is, so to say, a Mexican burger. If not, it's not a semita. There's also verdolagas, which are a type of a watercress, colorin, a local tree where you can eat those flowers, and uh, one of the most common quelites, which is uh, epazote, which uh, you're probably aware of. But you can also get different types of seeds from the, from the milpa. You can see here uh, from the local market, she has um, this lady semitas from the chilacayote, which it's kind of a, a, a trepadora squ a squash. Uh, that's I forgot to say trepadora in English that grows along the the, the the walls or the trees. And here you can have the the seeds that are very good. You can have tacos with them. And this is the cherry or the seed of the capulin, the tree I showed you before. And of course pumpkin pumpkin seeds. Another important thing, which I call I call the green, green meat within the milpa system is the nopales, the pre-prepared cactus, opuntia uh, um, paddle or leaves. And uh, I put some humiles there, which, uh, which are the local, some insects that you can have uh, locally. So I, I really like insects, insects. So those are humiles, which is a stink bug basically, which are very delicious. They have a a taste that's very similar to green green apples. But you can also eat the nopal heart, in case you weren't aware of this. Those old nopales that are this nopal that you see there that was cut was about 35 years old. So you can even eat in times of necessity. You can have water and you can have fibers and uh, nutritious from, from the nopal heart. And of course, you can get the, I didn't put them here, the fruits, but you can get the choconosle or the prickly pear, pear fruit from this Opuntia plant. Um, let me see. It's... And well, one of the last uh, things I wanted to talk about, not the least important, the most common, common which is the, the blue corn or the corn varieties in this part of, of Mexico. That's a picture that you can see from um, from San Mateo Solco, this indigenous community that's 30 minutes away from Cholula. And this is the type of blue corn that they grow in this land, which is more than three, th around 3,000 meters from sea of level. And they basically make the nixtamal. It's very important for people to learn the nixtamal or the hominy, I think you say in English, where you can have the, the dried kernel, you cook it in a limestone solution, you then cook it, I mean, grind it, and you can have a, this dough to make the different types of tortillas. Uh, these are the blue tortillas that are native to, to the, native to this area. But you don't only make tortillas, as I'm sure you're aware of, from the corn dough, you can have different types of tamales. Here on, on your screen on the left, you can see 
in the le top left, three types of tamales. You have a mole, a green sauce tamale, and a rajas. But, and on the bottom, the jarocho tamales, but those are mo mostly obtained in the city. But in the communities, you can see the tamale that's in the middle. They make tamales out of the local wild herb, like elites. And on the right, you can see fiesta tamales that are called tamales tontos, which means translates to dumb tamales because it's only corn dough. It doesn't have any other additive. But this tamale is used for the parties, the fiestas, the holidays, for the mole to go along with, with mole. And this is the mole, the fiesta that you can typically find here around in the valley of Cholula and Puebla. And the uh, memelas, tlacoyos, on the left, you can see the memela with the green and the red sauce. That's uh, basically a thin dough of corn, corn dough with bean paste. That's what I usually have for breakfast when I'm here and not traveling. And on the right, you can see some tlacoyos, which I even brought some. I told my mom, these are kind of the, the size you can see in my hand, the size of the normal tlacoyos, but you can get memela, which is a little bit bigger. So this is what I'm gonna have for lunch right now. And uh, you can see we have slow food here in the house also, but um, that's almost the size of the different types of, of memelas and the tlacoyos that you can find. With tlacoche, the Mexican truffle, the fungus that grows um, within every corn kernel that gets infected and they grow like a, like a delicious, delicious tumor, so to say. So the milpa is basically a complete meal where you can have thousands of varieties of dishes, you can have a simple taco with chilacayote seeds and a sauce, or something more complex like what you have. You can see in the middle a chef made a, a salad with different flowers, with different herbs, with the maguey heart, with the nopal heart, or you can have a basic broth with broad beans, nopales, and the herbs. So the milpa is, as Ricardo said, the future. It's also the past. And it's something in Slow Food Mexico we're trying to help uh, farmers obtain, um, obtain access to market through the added value of the milpa. And with this, I want to finalize showing you some projects that we're helping out in this area of Cholula and Puebla. For example, young people from San Mateo Solco, if you're not aware of, half of the community of San Mateo Solco is in the city of Philadelphia. I was in Philadelphia for a year. Uh, in 2011, working with the indigenous migrants to sell blue cornmeal. And now in Cholula, they opened a cafeteria where they're selling blue corn ice cream. They're also making blue corn chips, blue corn tostada. So this is kind of the future for the added values of the milpa system that um, can help them get a fair, fair price for their products. And something that's more new is blue corn. Blue corn beer is part of our uh, campaign of slow beer in Mexico. So we're um, making alliances with different breweries so they can, they can start using local traditional products. And this is the first slow beer that was produced in Mexico four years ago, which is a, which is a blue corn cream ale beer from Michoacan, in, from the Michoacan Milpas. So thank you very much. And we're here to answer any questions that you, you may have. All right, thank you both Ricardo and Alfonso. That was really great. Um, so we'll open it up to a quick Q&A. Uh, we have still some time here. Um, so we'll start with Charity. Um, she's asking a uh, really good question. How could we elevate the Milpa system to the arc of taste? Um, so I'm sure Alfonso and Ricardo, you both um, could have ideas here. So whoever would like to go first. That's for Alfonso. That's a slow food question. Yeah, that's what I thought. Um, um, basically, uh, the Arc of Taste, as you're aware, is a catalog of different foods that have a certain risk of disappearing because either we're losing them genetically or because we're, we're, we stopped using them culturally uh, for food as gastronomy. And um, basically, I talk this with Slow Food International, and it's difficult to put a polyculture milpa system in the Arc of Taste. But what we are doing is integrating in this list the different Kelites products that you can find within the Milpa system. And what hopefully we do this year is create the first Presidia Baluarte that is called 
the Presidia of the Milpa, where we integrate all these different products and we help farmers that are preserving this agroecological ecosystem called as a Milpa. So it's easier to promote it as a Presidia than as an arc of taste. That's great. Thank you, Alfonso. All right. Well, um, we, like I said, we still have some time here, but um, if we don't have any other questions, um, we can go ahead and wrap up. Uh, Alfonso and Ricardo, do you have any last comments that you'd like to, to make um, or else we can end a bit early? Our, My only comment sure is how are, Oh, go ahead. How are we, oh, enter your message. Mm -hmm. okay. Uh, Barry, did you have a question? Yeah, can you hear me or do I type this in? No, we can hear you, go ahead. Okay, I was curious about the agave that was being used in the milpa, that uh, after they harvest the heart and they take whatever else out of it, how long does it take to replace the agave or does that regenerate within itself? Uh, no, you basically have to kill the agave. That's why you take out the heart because you have to stop stop it from growing because uh -huh. if you don't take out the heart, the stock will come and the stock will drink all the sap and the mm -hmm. sap is a precious liquid that they need to ferment to become pulque. But uh, the the agave usually lasts for six months to, a, to eight, depending on how big the plant is uh, to obtain the sap. But the interesting thing is that while the agave plant or maguey, which the maguey is the agave that produces pulque or aguamiel to make pulque, uh, mm -hmm. while it's growing during those 15 or 20 years, there are uh, some small plants that are clones of the big agave that grow, that grow along the maguey. So you can have while the vegetation phase of the maguey is, is growing, you can have more than 20 or 30 baby plants from that, from that agave plant. So it really is sustainable because it keeps growing like that. Exactly. It basically sacrifices itself for us to get food, but it's also you can use uh, the leaves for um, as to burn as fuel. You can mm -hmm. use the plants to make ishtle, which is the ancient um, cloth. You can use it to make houses. So it's really sustainable. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with the agave week in Tucson, Arizona? Um, I am not, but I think it's a more due to the the type of area. I would think it's more similar to the to the mezcal tequila cac agaves, no, smaller and thinner. Uh, I they look very similar to the photographs that I saw on your presentation. Um, but we have a, a festival, a, a, an agave festival week here in Tucson, or it's actually about two weeks. It starts. Um, in April, about the middle of April, and goes to the first week of May. So I would urge you to take a look at Agave, Agave Week in Tucson, Arizona. So we have several people who are coming to, uh, to speak and present uh, uh, about the agave, its future, et cetera. So I would urge our other listeners to take a look at that Agave Week here in Tucson, Arizona. Perfect. Thank you. Barry, we can see what we can do and maybe the Presidia of the Maguey Agave plant in Mexico can visit this event and, and propose. We, we, would, we, would we would love that. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. How do I get in touch with these speakers? Do I, if, I, if I want to write them later, is there a way to contact them? I, I see their names. Is there an email address? Um, are you looking to get in touch with Alfonso specifically? Yeah, uh, yeah, I, we could send off, you know, whatever questions I have or information about Agave Week. They might be interested in being aware of it at least, and and if not for this year, perhaps next year. And then, of course, Tucson is a uh, the, was the first city of gastronomy uh, uh, through UNESCO. So we're very excited about this opportunity to be a part of the Agave Festival. Yes, that's great. Alfonso just shared his email in the chat box. Um, very good. That's terrific. Okay, great. Thank you for your question, Barry, um, and good luck with your festival. It sounds really, really interesting. Sure. Um, Absolutely. And Joel, we have a question from you um, to Alfonso. Um, he said, you mentioned that the Milpa system is now more well known in the U.S. now than in Mexico. Uh, could you elaborate on this disconnect 
Is this just in terms of knowledge of the system or actual implementation of the system? Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't remember mentioning something like that. If I did, maybe I meant the, the tostadas or the, the blue corn, but I don't know if in the States, I mean, if in Mexico, people don't know milpa to be this polyculture agroecological system, I'm not sure in the States uh, they're much aware, maybe more with the, the chefs, because since the UNESCO recognized the Michoacan gastronomy as an intangible heritage, uh, the chefs have now been using more the milpa uh, as a discourse for marketing, so maybe some chefs are using it, but I don't know if it's more well known in the US than in Mexico. Um, and then Aaron, did you have a question? Can you hear us, Aaron? Yes, I can. Sorry, I was just trying to figure out how to unmute myself. <clears throat> no problem. I'm a, a farmer and a um, farmer's market operator out in the San Francisco Bay Area and work with a number of um, uh, various and sundry up and coming farmers, uh, many of them from, um, from Mexico, who are um, uh, <clears throat> challenged. And I wonder if anyone has any. Um, resources for some um, for seed or rootstock for any a number of those um, plants that you had had. To be honest, maybe Ricardo might, might know. I know there's many seed exchange, and you can buy seeds even online in the U.S. and Mexico. We're not there yet uh, because here the communities have their own seeds, and maybe of those herbs I presented to you, they grow wildly within the milpa, but I don't know, Ricardo, do you know in the US, you can get papalo or elitas seeds? Uh, that would be really difficult for uh, lots of reasons, um, but biologically you would need to have uh, seeds that were adapted to the particular area that you're speaking of. And do I understand correctly, Erin, you're interested in um, these species that could be grown in the Bay Area or in various areas of California? Uh, it's primarily, I'm south of San Francisco, north of Santa Cruz. And um, yeah, I, I, I certainly recognize that having um, adapted um, sources is, is important. We just, there's a number of these folks that I've worked with and of course my Spanish is not great, but <laughs> so um, it's been a, a difficult thing for me as a, a non-native speaker to try and support these folks who are to try and figure out if there's a, if there is a resource or some sort of a, um, uh, that would be available for locally adapted seeds that are, that are appropriate for this kind of growing system in this area. Yeah, well, maybe two things to try. Um, so uh, Joel, who spoke earlier, may have more information on this. There is an organization uh, in Arizona, which is called Native Seeds Search, that actually collects land-raised seeds and uh, multiplies them and sells them. Uh, it would be a matter of experimenting or picking wisely in terms of adaptation, but they do specialize in you know, as the name of the organization indicates, uh, land races and traditional varieties, the sorts of things that you wouldn't find in the more commercial catalogs. Um, and the other thing to try because of the area that you're in is that um, just uh, to the southwest of where you're telling me that you are in the Salinas Valley, there is a, an organization that's known by the acronym of ALBA. Uh -huh. And uh, okay, I know uh, if you're familiar. Okay, I, very good. So I, the farmers that I'm working with are Alba graduates. So okay, very good. So yeah. then you know all about them, and just so that everybody doesn't uh, wonder, the the key thing about Alba is that they see farm labor as budding entrepreneurs, and they prepare these folks so that they don't just persist in farm labor, but they can actually tap into their potential as business people, get them the resources and the knowledge that they need. And because that's what they do, then I wonder whether they also have had a similar question and know where you can get locally adapted species for people that want to replicate this kind of polycoal system. Now, I'll just say, uh, you all are probably aware, but I should just name it so that uh, uh, nobody labors under a misperception. 
Uh, what what Alfonso and I have laid out here, and particularly uh, conviction that we're talking about very sophisticated systems that are the future of agricultural practice all around the planet, is decidedly a minority view. And so when you go around talking about polycultural systems and looking for resources to practice them, you go to established authorities, very often than not, you'll get blank stares, first of all, not understanding the concept. And then once the concept is understood, because this is not what is taught in traditional agricultural institutions or even an understanding that those institutions have, then you will most likely receive lectures about how that's backward and that that's not going to feed the <laughs> world and why would you waste your time. So I just want to make sure that I don't leave that misperception. I'm definitely talking to you about a minority view, but I couldn't be more convicted about that. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. Um, and leading off of that, Ingrid had a question, um, and maybe you can answer this, Ricardo. Do you know of any examples of small farms successfully adapting the MILPA system in the U.S. with commercial potential? No, I don't know of any uh, farms that take the, uh, any commercial farms that take the polycultural approach uh, seriously. There's lots of obstacles so far, and just basically getting these ideas out there um, and then providing the technical information and the resources that farmers like this would require, that's quite an operation. And I agree that we need to start uh, working on this. Um, actually, uh, in the prior question, we uh, used Santa Cruz as a point of reference, and that's one of the agricultural institutions that actually is open to this kind of thinking. It's the institution where the scientific study of agroecology which is the study of these polycultural systems and the recognition that you can't separate the practice of agriculture from the well-being of the people that practice that agriculture. That's kind of a hotspot in the United States. And there are probably folks there that can speak more to this, but the state of the art in the United States is usually to try to make the industrial system less bad, you know, to introduce more sustainable practices to monocultural systems. And we're still quite a way away from the polycultural idea. Now, uh, there are small garden settings, you know, uh, places where people are growing for self-provisioning, uh, where I've seen particularly in urban uh, settings where people are into the uh, the idea of the milpa and polycultures, but uh, not in the sense that you're asking. Actually, um, I, sorry to interrupt. This is Aaron again, but there is one farm <clears throat> that I actually work with and have for quite some time that is called La Milpa. Um, so I'm by a woman, uh, Maria Reyes de Luz, and um, her husband worked for Dole down there for a long time while she was getting this farm going, which is, it's relatively small, but they are a self-sustaining uh, farm that works in that system. She's part of the reason that I'm looking to try and um, help sort of move that out of Salinas and a little farther north to the population that is on the coast uh, here, which is quite a bit more isolated than Salinas. The uh, agricultural infrastructure here is pretty fractured by the Silicon Valley uh, economy and um, desire for every internet magnate to have its own private Idaho out here. <laughs> and, um, uh, so she's, uh, again, her name is, uh, the, the farm itself is called La Milpa. They are in their direct market farmers um, they participate in three of the four farmers markets that I, uh, sorry, in, in two of the three farmers markets that I operate in another one down in Monterey. And the, the produce that they, uh, that she grows is, is unbelievable. It's, it's gorgeous. And um, they have just graduated their third child through UC Berkeley. Um, and it is a, a fully self-sustaining operation. And part of the reason that I was really interested in getting in on this call because uh, my Spanish and her English don't always coincide, although I have a general understanding. And um, again, I'm sort of <clears throat> trying to support the, the sort of nurturing of that idea um, a little bit further north <clears throat> in a way because she's just like, she's a farmer like I am and you know has 10 pounds of compost and a five pound sack all the time. So can't necessarily be the one being the ambassador for this, but she's a, a great example of someone who is operating with that system and flourishing. 
yeah, that, that's great to hear about that. And uh, you, you probably know this already, but uh, uh, I'm willing to see whether there are uh, researchers or faculty at, at uh, UC Santa Cruz rather than Berkeley or Davis who might be of support to her. Mm -hmm. Well, great, thank you for these questions. Um, Alfonso, I wonder, so we've been getting a couple questions about um, these products being at Slow Food Nations this year. Um, do you want to share a little bit more about the uh, workshop that I mentioned in the beginning, the art of ancient art of tortillas with Benedicta? Um, yeah, um, tor um, Benedicta, which is a Purepecha indigenous uh, master cook, she has that, that name in Michoacán. Um, we'll be preparing different uh, tortillas with different corn doughs, and she will teach you what her specialty, how she makes her own nixtamal or hominy, and uh, with different doughs, different tortillas, and different dishes that come from the milpa from Michoacán, which is very different for the, from the milpa in Puebla. There's many herbs and ingredients that she uses that I don't know of, so it's going to be very very interesting. Great. Um, okay, well, I think we'll go ahead and wrap it here. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, Ricardo and Alfonso, for your um, presentations. Um, we hope that everyone will join us in Denver for Slow Food Nations. Um, and when you do become a member, if you become a member this weekend, um, during Give What You Can Day, you get 20% discount um, on all tickets at Slow Food Nations. So another great incentive to become a member and, and join us in Denver. Um, so thank you again, and we'll be sharing this presentation with the slides um, on social media. So um, if you want to go back and reference any of these um, really cool pictures from Alfonso, um, then we'll have that up on Facebook later today. So thank you again, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Have a good day. We'll be in touch if you have any questions. Take care. Thank you, everyone. See you at Slow Food Nations. Thank you, Amanda. We'll be in touch then. Okay. Thanks, Alfonso. Take care. Have a good day. You too.